Oh, hallelujah. Well, we're going to go ahead and get into this study this morning, which is entitled The Beginning to the End. What we're going to do is we're going to look at Scripture from Genesis all the way through Revelations. And we'll just start our study this morning with the Tanakh. And we'll go through each book and give an overview of what happened in that book. And we're going to see if there's any any kind of direction that's given to us, any kind of overview that we can see that may bring a little more clarity to the plans of Yahuwah. He says in Bereshit or Genesis 1.1, In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. We also find in Yochanan or John 1 and 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Elohim, and the Word was Elohim. Thus we find that the Word is who Yahuwah is, who Yahusha is the Word. So if we read this, what it says in the beginning, if we read it the way that it should read is, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with Elohim, and the word was Elohim. We know that Yahuwah is Aloha. Yahuwah the Father is Echad, or one. We know that Elohim is this a title used by Yahuwah when he acts with justice? It is a title given to his Mashiach when he judges. And it is also a title given to men when they are judges. So what is it that connects Yahuwah, Yahusha, and certain men that they should be called Elohim or gods? Well, we've done this study to see that it really means plural when we talk about this. So we're trying to grab a better understanding of who is this word. We spoke, who spoke the word? Who's the power of this word? What is this word declaring to us? It leads us and it guides us in this life that we live, if we believe in it, if we trust in it. It'll show us answers to our questions. There's many things that are hidden within the scriptures. There's been different types of studies done with computers and uh, to pull apart these words and, and to see if there's any hidden codes and messages within. And many believe that there's prophecies, uh, hidden messages, hidden codes within there that will reveal things that will predict the futures and events that happened all the way through history if we just have an eye to see them. So that's kind of the purpose of this study this morning is to really try to engage and to review the entire scriptures and the events that transpired to see if there's any messages that are maybe hidden in the overviews of this scriptures. I believe there's many facets and many levels, many dimensions when it comes to Yahuwah. And I believe it's the same with his scripture, his word. And if he'll allow us, his Ruach, to lead us through this study, I believe we're going to gain a much better understanding of his collective plan, his purpose, and his message to us. So we see that the words that were spoken by Yahuwah were written down by the men, his, his prophets, his scribes, those that 
wrote his word down so that we all have it today to preserve it for us so that we also can study and understand I know that we've talked about this once before, but I want to reiterate this once again. We, we'll go back to John 1, 1 and through 3, where he talks about in the beginning was a law, or gods, if you will, Elohim. And all things were made by him, and without him nothing was made. See, in this passage, it says that the Word created everything. The Word created everything. So what is the answer? Yahuwah. He spoke the Word. It came out of his mouth and created that which Yahuwah commanded. And this way we can see that Yahuwah created everything by his Word. The Word, Yahusha, created that which Yahuwah commanded. This shows that Yahuwah and the Word Yahusha are related but again, the word is not the speaker. Yahuwah is the speaker, and the word is Yahusha, which Yahuwah spoke and created everything through and by and for. He was given the reign and kingship over the kingdom of Yahuwah. Therefore, everything and the purpose of it was created for his purpose. Eventually, the spoken word became flesh. And it dwelt with us and became the fulfillment of Yahuwah's Torah and his prophets, which were spoken about him. The word is also called the Son, the only begotten Son, which came in his Father's name. And the name Yahusha really does declare that Yahuwah saves you. So that's the message that he came with. So when we declare that, that's what we're declaring. Since Yahusha is the door to Yahuwah, no one comes to the Father but through the Son. Yosh is that way. He is that word. He's the Torah. He is the life. He is the truth of Yahuwah. He's the physical image and likeness of Yahuwah. He said, when you see me, you have seen the Father. Yosh does nothing in his own. He only does what you see his Father do. Yahushua does nothing in his own. He only does what he is told, what his father tells him to do. He fulfills the father's will. And that's what this scripture is. This is what the Torah, the Tanakh, the New Testament, all of these things are a fulfillment of the father's will, which is Yahushua, the Torah. <laughs> we see in Genesis describes the creation it gives the history of the old world and of the steps taken by Yahuwah towards the formation of the system of government in which the priests rule in the name of Yahuwah Yahuwah is creator the creator Yahuwah is faithful to his covenant promises and redeems humanity through his promised line, despite their sins and the rebellion. Chapter 1 through 11, there was four outstanding events declaring Yahuwah's sovereign authority. Number one was the creation of Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, chapters 1 through 3. Cain kills Abel. Noah and the animals are... Uh, and, and the building of the ark, the great flood, the Tower of Babel, Yahuwah's governmental supremacy determining the course of human events. The scripture stories about Abraham and Lot. We also see the call of Abraham, the story of Jacob and Sarah, or Sarai. Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as Joseph and his coat of many colors and the interpretation of Pharaoh's dreams. 
See, these events demonstrate that man is not capable of governing himself to achieve peace with Yahuwah or without one another. Yahuwah's election and care for these people demonstrate that he is capable of accomplishing a plan of redeeming man back to himself in spite of man's character flaws and our weaknesses of the flesh. These outstanding characteristics of the book of Genesis demonstrate Yahuwah's sovereignty in exercising his authority over the earth and in electing certain people to be used in completing his plan of redemption. The book of Exodus, which is the second book of Moshe or Moses, is the book and it, uh, that came to, it actually contains 40 different chapters in Exodus. It's the second book of the Torah. The five books of Moshe were collectively called the Torah. The second book of Moses or, or Moses or Moshe is Exodus in English or Shemot in, in uh, Hebrew, which means names. Exodus is derived from the Greek word Exodus, meaning going out or departing, because it contains the history of the going out of the children of Israel out of Egypt. The Hebrews call it Velel Semov. These are the names. It contains transactions for 145 years from the death of Joseph, meaning he will add in the Tanakh to the erecting of the tabernacles. A short summary of the scripture stories of Exodus. We find the scriptural stories, the plots, the characters, and the events of the bondage of Egypt, the journey through the wilderness to Sinai, the covenant and the laws given at Mount Sinai, <coughs> the early life of Moshe or Moses. We also see that Moshe or Moses encountered Yahuwah at the burning bush. Moses returned to Egypt. Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh. We also see the plagues of the frogs and the flies, the plagues of the animals, of boils and of hail, of locusts and darkness, the plagues on the firstborn. We also see Passover. Then the exodus from Egypt taking place. We also see the Israelites crossing the Red Sea, the giving of the commandments, the Ten Commandments. We also seen what we're not to do in putting and creating another image where they built the golden calf. We see the tabernacle and the ark is built. Leviticus. It's the third book of Moses. It's also the third book in the Tanakh, or the Old Testament of the Hebrew Scriptures, and it contains 27 chapters. This book is called Leviticus because it details the offices, the ministries, the rites and the ceremonies of the priest and the Levites. Leviticus is a prophecy of things to come. The Hebrew call it Vikra, from the word which it becomes or it begins. We can look at an uh, overview of the events and the people found in Leviticus together with the famous scripture stories and a brief summary of this book Leviticus will show us how to make offerings, how to offer a grain offering, regulations to the priest for the burnt and grain and sin offerings, 
Aaron and his sons are ordained and begin their services. It also gives us the law of clean and unclean food, the Day of Atonement, how to punish violators of the law, special rules for the priest, the appointed feast of Yahuwah's Sabbath, Passover, the first fruit, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles, which is very important due to the time that we are living in, that we understand these, since we are commanded to observe them forever. Book of Numbers. It contains the fourth book of Scripture. It's also the fourth book of Moses. Or Moshe, Moses. It has 36 chapters. The five books of of uh, Moses were called, are called the uh, the Torah. Numbers is the fourth of the books of the Torah, and it's and it has a is a meaning of in the wilderness. The book is called Numbers because it contains a record of the numbering of the people in the wilderness of Sinai and afterwards on the plains of Moab. The Hebrews from its first word called Vyabber. Vyabber? Don't know if that's how you pronounce it exactly. V-A-I-E-D-A-B-B-E-R. Numbers contains the transactions of the Israelites from the second month of the second year after they're going out of Egypt until the beginning of the 11th month of the 14th year. A history of almost 39 years is, is covered in the book of Numbers. It talks about the first census of the Israelites, the offering and the dedication of the tabernacle, it also uh, reveals the, the when the uh, Israel uh, the Israelites left the Sinai. See so Miriam and Aaron oppose Moses in the book. The people don't want to go to Canaan, and Yahuwah punishes them for forty years in the desert. Here we see that Yahuwah appoints Yahusha or Joshua as the successor of Moses or Moshe. See, the preparation for the departure from Sinai we find in 1 1 through 10. The events described here took place in 19 days. And this time, a census was taken of all men who were over 20. And who could serve in military efforts, found in chapters 1 through 4. The total obtained was 603,550, which we find in 1 verse 46. This would indicate that the total population of the group was probably near or around, somewhere around uh, about 200,000, I uh, believe, is what the number calculates out to be. I'm sorry, that number is not accurate. Around 3 million is the number that should be there. The census was followed by the cleansing and the baraka of the congregation, the offering of gifts from the various tribes, the consecration of the Levites, which are the priests, and the observance of the Passover at Sinai. We also see the journey from Sinai to the Gadesh Barnea, which is in 10 and 11 through uh, 45. This uh, section includes the account of the coming of the quail, the rebellion against Moses by Miriam and Aaron, and the fatal mission of the spies, which you find in verse 13 and 14. The wandering of the desert wilderness from 15 to 19, as noted before, this covers a period of 
of about 37 years from the end of the second to the beginning of the 40th year in the wilderness, which we find in chapter 15, which includes various laws and a record of capital punishments for Sabbath breaking, the rebellion of, of Korah, and the, the budding of Aaron's rod are also mentioned here in chapter 17. The history of the last year from the second arrival of the Israelites at Kadesh till they reached the plains of Moab by, by Yarden or Jordan near Jericho. We find that notable sections of this are the story of Balaam, the zeal of the Penea, the second census, the instructions for dividing the land, the appointment of Yahusha or Joshua as Moses or Moshe's successor, the various laws concerning offerings and vows, the war with Midian, the settlement of the tribes east of the of the Jordan or Jordan, a review of the locations at which Israel had camped during their wanderings. There was also more instructions concerning the conquests and the division of Canaan, the appointment of the cities of refuge, and the instructions concerning the marriage of land-owning Israelite women. All of these things are covered within that book. So there's a lot of information there to go through, but this kind of gives you an overview of what took place at that time. The book of De Deuteronomy, or the book of Devarim, the Hebrew word Devarim means the second law. See, the English Bibles derive their name from two separate Greek words, which is uh, Deutero and Nomos. Deutero is second in Greek, and pneumos means law in Greek. So it's the second law is what it, what that means when in the in the English Bibles where they get the word Deuteronomy. This book contains the fifth book of Moshe's, Moshe. It's the fifth book of the Tanakh. Or of the, of the scriptures. It also contains 34 chapters. This book is named from the Greek word Deuteronomy, which means the second law, because it repeats and in, in, in it ordains or gives the ordinances formally given on Mount Sinai with other precepts not uh, expressed before. So it kind of expands or expounds upon that. Deuteronomy consists of three sermons delivered by Moses. The Hebrews from the first word in the book call it Eli Hadibaron. The Israelites wandered in the desert and defeat Shihon. Moses goes up the Mount Sinai a second time and gets the Ten Commandments inscribed in new stone tablets. Yahusha or Joshua is assigned to be Moses or Moshe's successor here. We also find that Moses dies and Yahusha or Joshua takes over. Yahuwah's people are called to respond to Yahuwah's salvation with love and loyalty, worshiping the one true Elohim in the midst of surrounding cultural idolatries and living in the midst of nations as a community shaped at every level of life by Yahuwah's character of grace, his justice, his purity, his compassion, and his generosity. What we see here is kind of an example for how us to live amongst this sinful world, if you will, these people that are surrounding us that have nothing to do with Yahuwah, it kind of gives us an, uh, an overview of what it is to live amongst heathen 
pagans, if you will, and not to adopt their ways. The next book we find is we call Joshua in English, Yahusha. It's the, the sixth book in the Tanakh, and it contains 24 chapters. This also refers to uh, the book of Joshua, and it contains the history of what happened under Yahusha or Joshua, and according to the common opinion, was written by him. Verses from Joshua contain the history of the conquest of the land, the allotment of the land to the different tribes, and the farewell address of Joshua with an account of his death. Yahuwah tells Joshua, or Yahusha, that he has to be strong and courageous. The Israelites cross the Jordan to get to Jericho. The Israelite armor start, uh, their armies then start the battle of Jericho loudly uh, blowing the, the shofar and shouting. We also find that the walls of Jericho come tumbling down, and the Israelites are victorious here. The next book is Judges. The book is the number seven book of the Tanakh. It contains 21 chapters. This book is called Judges because it contains the history of what passed under the government of the uh, men who bore the title of judges, who ruled Israel before they had kings. It also contains the history of the 13 judges. The writer of it, according to more general opinion, was the prophet Samuel. Judges covered the period from the death of Joshua to the birth of Samuel. After the death of Moses and Joshua, Yahuwah raises various men and women called judges to lead Israel into battle and out of oppression. The song of Deborah, the story uh, of Barak and, and, and Deborah are found in this book. The account of Gideon who leads an army of 300 to defeat an enemy of thousands. In the story of Samson and Delilah, Delilah, Samson, a judge, famous for his long hair as a sign of his Yahuwah-given superhuman strength, Samson is seduced by a Philistine named Delilah who cuts his hair when he is asleep. See, the book of Judges demonstrates that if the Israelites survived the dark days of the Canaanism, under the judges, it is, it, it is entirely unto Yahuwah's credit. The history of the nation of Joshua or Yahusha to Samson. Yahuwah develops heroes. Yahuwah uses flawed people here. Yahuwah's Ruach HaKodesh empowers people. All of these things are, are referenced within this book of Judges. The next book is Ruth. Ruth is a book, uh, it's the eighth book of the Tanakh, and it only contains four chapters. This book is called Ruth from the name of the person whose history is here. Who, being a Gentile, became a convert to the true faith, and marrying Boaz, the great-grandfather of David, was one of those from whom our Messiah, Yahusha, came according to the flesh. The word Gentile derives from the Latin gentilius, meaning of or belonging to a non-Israelite tribe or nation is what that means. So whenever you hear that word Gentile, that's what that means. Basically, it's, non, it's not an Israelite. It's not part of the tribe or the nation of Israel. It is thought the book of Ruth was written by the prophet Samuel. 
The Book of Ruth contains an episode from the period of the judges. Alim Elek with his wife Naomi and his two sons Mahalon and Chilion leave the famine in Israel and move to the land of Moab. Naomi's husband and sons die and she returns to Israel with her daughter-in-law whose name is Ruth, which was the Gentile. Ruth converts to the faith and marries Boaz. They have a son called Obed, who will become the grandfather of King David. See, the story of the ancestors of the royal family of Yehuda are found here. Yehuda is committed to his people even in the darkest days. He will preserve his plan of salvation through a Kadosh king. For both Hebrews and Gentiles. See, Yahuwah is in control despite our desperation, is the main story of this book of Ruth. The next book is 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel is uh, book number nine in the Tanakh, and it contains 31 chapters. The book of Samuel and of Kings were originally divided by translators into four books called the Book of the Kingdom. The four books of Samuel were, uh, Samuel were then included in the books of the Kings, but then changed in modern Protestant versions to the first and the second books of Samuel. First Kings and Second Kings are called by the Hebrews the Book of Samuel because they contain his history. The authors of the books of Samuel were believed to be Samuel, Gad, and Nathan. The summary of 1 Samuel contains the history of Eli, Samuel, Saul, and of David in exile. Also, the reign of David is detailed in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel is the first of the two historical books which details Israel's rise from a group of a tribes to a united nation. Hannah, the mother of Samuel, leaves him in the care of the priest, and Samuel grows up to become a great prophet of Israel. The appointing of the first king of Israel, who was Saul, by the prophet Samuel. Saul sins and is rejected by Yahuwah. We also find David and Goliath here. David is a young shepherd kills the Philistine Goliath, a nine-foot giant with a single sling, uh, single slingshot, hitting right in the head. Saul is jealous of his bravery and tries to kill him, so David goes into hiding. Saul then dies, and Samuel chooses David as his successor. The reign of King David is detailed in 2 Samuel. To the story of the nations during the judgment or the judgeship of Samuel and the reign of Saul. Even the best human leaders fail us, but Yahuwah is faithful to his people and promises a king who would be powerful, who would be wise, righteous, and faithful. Yahuwah reveals himself to the spiritually sensitive, those that are sensitive to his ruach. Yahuwah champions those who trust him despite overwhelming odds. And Yahuwah is concerned about national leadership, which we find in verses 10 through 16. See, disobedience spells demotion here in 13, 15, and 28. It also gives us a warning about dabbling with the occult, which we find in verses 28 as well. The book of 2 Samuel. It's the 10th book of the Tanakh, and it contains 24 chapters. 
the book of Samuel and of Kings were originally divided by translators into four books called the books of Kings, which I mentioned earlier. The four books of Samuel were then included in the book of Kings, but then changed in modern Protestant versions to the first and the second books of Samuel. Again, first and second Kings are called by the Hebrews the book of Samuel because they contain his history. The authors of the book of Samuel were believed to be Samuel, Gad, and Nathan. The summary of of, uh, of these books are contained here within the books of, of, of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel contains an account of David's sin and the matter of Bathsheba, but is omitted in the correspondent passages in 1 Chronicles 20. David leads Israel to many victories in battle. David sleeps with Bathsheba, who was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. David then has Uriah killed so he can marry her. David repents of his sin and Yahuwah forgives him. Bathsheba gives birth to Solomon. The next book is 1 Kings. It's the 11th book of the Tanakh, or the Old Testament, and it contains 22 chapters. Who wrote the book of, uh, of uh, 1 Kings is uncertain, but the common opinion is that Samuel composed the first book as far as the 25th chapter, and that the prophet Nathan and Gad finished the first and, and wrote the second book. You can also see uh, 1 Chronicles 29.29. 29. It is believed that the book of Kings was written and composed from B.C. 561 to B.C. 538. The two books of Kings formed originally one book in Hebrew scriptures. They covered the period of about 450 years from the reign of Solomon to the conquest of the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians between the 10th and the 6th century BC. David has Solomon anointed as the next king. The wisdom of Solomon famous for settling the argument about a baby who he orders to be cut in half so he can determine who is the real mother. Solomon becomes Israel's wisest and richest king and builds Israel's first temple to Yahuwah in Jerusalem, the temple of Solomon. Also contains the golden age of Solomon, Solomon's decline in his death. Queen of Sheba, 1 Kings 10, 1 through 13. Elijah, Ahab, and Jezebel, and Elisha are all, fine with, uh, are all found here. We see that the, the stories of, the, of, the, of this book plot and the characters and the events detailed here are all outlined to give us a better understanding of what took place during this period of time. Second Kings is the 12th book of the Tanakh, which contains 25 chapters. First and second Kings are called by the Hebrews the book of Samuel because they contain his history. It also contains the history of the two kings, Saul and David, whom he anointed. So the two books of Kings formed originally one book in the Hebrew Scriptures, which we talked about earlier. But in the, 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 the English Bibles, they, they split them into two different books.
It, it all covers about 450 years from the reign of Solomon to the conquest of the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians between the 10th and the 6th century B.C., the divided kingdom of Judah and Israel, the descendants of Solomon take the throne, the story of Jezebel. Jezebel was a Phoenician prince, the daughter of Ethbal, who was the king of the Phoenicians. Jezebel became the wife of Ahab, the king of the north of Israel. Ahab and Jezebel allow temples of Baal in Israel. Bad move. A prophet called Elijah performs miracles, but is persecuted by Ahab. Elijah defeats the king's false prophets by calling down fire from the heavens. Elijah is taken up into the heavens by Yahuwah, and Elisha takes over and performs miracles. The prophet Elisha uh, arranges to anoint Yahuwah as king in order to overthrow the family of Ahab, and Jezebel is killed. The Israelites are captive, are captured by uh, Babylonians, and their temples are destroyed. The tribes of Israel are completely deported to other regions of Assyrian Empire, becoming the lost ten tribes. The land is attacked by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian king. The scripture stories detail all of this within the book of Second Kings. The next are the books of the Chronicles, are so-called as being the record made by the appointed uh, histori histor historical uh, recorders of the kingdom of Yehuda or Judah and Israel. They are the official histories of those kingdoms. They restore the people, raise up the king, and renew the temples. Then Yahuwah will pour out his baraka. So we find in First Chronicles in the Tanakh, <laughs> this is the big, big one here that I try to pronounce here for you. Paralithomion is an obsolete name for the books of First Chronicles and Second Chronicles, which were regarded as supplementary to the kings. The author of Chronicles one is believed to be Ezra. In the, in the English Bibles, First uh, Chronicles 1 are part of the historical books of the Tanakh, or the Old Testament, following the kings and before Ezra. First Chronicles contains many gene genealogical lists and it ends with the house of Saul and Saul's rejection of Yahuwah's leading to the rise of David. First Chronicle verses from chapter 11 through 29 is the history of David's reign. First Chronicles provides a genealogy list of the descendants from Noah to the captivity in Babylon. It also lists Israel's priests, its temples, and its armies, divisions. It recaps the, the reign and the life of King David. Second Chronicles. The author is believed to be Ezra. Second Chronicles chapter one through nine is a history of the reign of King Solomon, son of King David, including the temple of Solomon. Second Chronicles chapter 10 through 36 is the chronicle of King of Judah or Yehuda to the time of the exile. The King of Judah, which we find in chapter 12, Rehoboam, chapter 13, Abijah, chapter 14 through 16, Asha, 17 through 20 is Jehoshaphat, 21 is Jehoram. 
chapter 22, Ahaza, 22, Athala, and it just go, continues on all the way through chapter 36 until it comes to an end at the exile. We find Ezra is the next book, which is a, a number 15 in the Tanakh of Scripture, and it contains 10 chapters. See, so yeah, at one time the book of Ezra was included with the book of Nehemiah. They were actually one book again. And the Hebrews regarded them as one volume, as one book. We find that Ezra contains records of events occurring at the close of the Babylonian exile. The events detailed occurred during the reign of Cyrus the Great and Darius and I don't even know how to pronounce that name. Artiarax Longmios, something like that. <laughs> the Babylon, the Babylon was eventually taken over by the Persian Empire. We also find that the Persian king allowed the Israelites to return to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple. Nehemiah leads many Israelites back to Jerusalem to rebuild its city walls. The completion and dedication of the new temple in Jerusalem is found here. We also find the history of the second return under Ezra and of the events that took place at Jerusalem after Ezra's arrival there. The story of the return of the Hebrews from the Babylonian captivity and of the rebuilding of the temple. The next book is Nehemiah that we find, which is the 16th book of the Tanakh. contains 13 chapters. Who was Nehemiah? Nehemiah was the son of Hakaliah, and probably of the tribe of Yehuda, belonging to Jerusalem. He was one of the Hebrews of the dispersion. The author is believed to be Nehemiah, The book was probably written between 431 and 430 when Nehemiah had returned the second time to Jerusalem after his visit to Persia. We find here that Nehemiah leads a many Israelites back to Jerusalem to build its city walls, rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. The register Nehemiah had found of those who had returned from Babylon the state of the religion among the Hebrews during this time. This is also the census of the adult male population of Jerusalem and the names of the chiefs together with the list of priests and Levites. The dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the arrangement of the temple officers, and the reforms carried out by Nehemiah himself. Esther is the next book, which is the 17th book of the Tanakh contains 10 chapters in it. The author of the book of Esther is unknown. But Esther was the queen of Osiris and the daughter of Abeliah and Benjamite. Esther appears in scripture as a woman of deep piety, faith, courage, patriotism, and caution. King Zaxerus has his queen expelled, and Esther, the adopted daughter of Morcari, a Hebrew, is chosen as queen. Mordecai learns of a plot to assassinate King Zaxerus, who informs Esther, who, is, who in turn tells the king. A man called Haman is promoted by King Zaxerus, who plots to exterminate the, the Hebrews, including Mordecai. Haman's plot goes wrong, and he leads his, uh, and he is hanged on the gallows that he intends for Mordecai. Mordecai is promoted in place of Haman, but he cannot revoke the legislation to exterminate the Hebrews. 
Mordecai therefore has a law passed that the Hebrews may defend themselves and retaliate on the day, and the Hebrews destroy their enemies. The story of, of a Hebrew who becomes a queen of Persia and saves a Hebrew people from destruction. The next book we find is Job. Job is the 18th book of the Tanakh or the Old Testament and contains 42 chapters. Job is essentially a historical poem which was well known in the days of Ezekiel, B.C. 600. In the Hebrew, it, was written in, uh, it is written in verse from the beginning of the third to the 40th second chapter. Who was Job? Job was Arabian patriarch who resided in the land of Oz, a rich man who was subject to many trials which he overcame with dignity and patience. It's uncertain who wrote this book of Job. Some attribute it to Job himself, others to Moses or one of the prophets. This book takes its name from a Kadosh holy man of whom it treats, whom uh, according to the more probable opinion was of the race of Esau, Esau and, the, and the same as Joab, the king of Edom, which is mentioned in Genesis 36 to 33. Job is the richest and the most righteous man in the East. We also find that Job loses everything. Job's third friend debates the affliction of Job, who, despite losing his wealth, his health, and his family, remains faithful to Yahuwah. Yahuwah eventually intervenes and Job is restored to prosperity. The story of the trials and the patience of this Kodesh man of Eden. The obedient suffering of a believer brings honor and esteem to Yahuwah. Yahuwah's people can expect to experience serious testing, which we find happening in our lives as well. Maybe not to the extreme of, of what we find in Job, but we still are tested the same. So we see in Psalms is the next book, number 19 in the Tanakh, which contains 150 chapters. The Psalms are called by the Hebrews Tehidim, Tehidim meaning hymns of praise. The word psalms is derived from the Greek word psalmiol, meaning songs of uh, song to a harp. The author of the book of psalms, of a great part of them at least, was King David. But many are of the opinion that some of them were made by Asaph and a variety of other authors. Psalms 1 through 41 is the advice of Yahuwah to man. Psalms 42 through 72 is the advice of Yahuwah to Israel. Psalm 73 to 89 is the sanctuary and the law. Psalms 90 through 106, Israel and the nation of the earth. Psalms 107 through 150, Yahuwah and his word. The next book we come across in scripture is the book of Proverbs, which is the 20th book of the Tanakh, which contains 31 chapters. Proverbs is, is, uh, is so-called because it con uh, consists of wise and weighty, uh, weight, weighted sentences, regulating the morals of men and directing them to wisdom and virtue. A proverb can be defined as a parable, The word uh, derives from the meaning to be like, or a parable. Solomon is said to have written 3,000 parables, or proverbs, and the book of Proverbs may be a selection of these. It gives words 
regulating the morals of men and directing them to wisdom and virtue. The Proverbs emphasize the external uh, religious life. They teach how to practice your beliefs and overcome the daily temptations. They express the belief of Yahuwah and his rule over the universe and therefore seek to make his, his uh, I don't want to use the word religion, but his, his belief system and controlling motives in life and conduct. Proverbs links good and bad with reward and penalty. Men are good or evil or wise or foolish. Proverbs recognizes the difficulties of living in Yahuwah's complex world and other uh, offers wise words to live by. It also speaks of the reverence for Yahuwah and the source of wisdom. It tells us that words carry power for good or evil. It also tells us that children need to heed their parents' wisdom. The next book, Ecclesiastes, the 21st book of the Tanakh, contains 12 chapters. Ecclesiastes is so called because the name derives from the Greek version of the Hebrew word koleth, which means preacher, a collector of sentences, a preacher, a son of David. The name of this book therefore signifies the preacher and reflects the wisdom of Yahuwah as preached by Solomon, who it is believed was the author of the book of Ecclesiastes. The writer represents himself implicitly as Solomon, which you find in Ecclesiastes 1.12, and is also known as the Confession of King Solomon. This book is called Ecclesiastes, or the preacher, because it, in it, Solomon, as an excellent preacher, it sets forth the, the vanity of the things of this world to withdraw the hearts and the affections of men from such empty toys. Ecclesiastes contains the views of Solomon on the meaning of life. Solomon explores the benefits and disappointments of pleasure, wisdom, hard work, and of Yahuwah. And Solomon concludes that man should love and fear Yahuwah and obey his commandments. The next we find the Song of Solomon. It's the 22nd book in the Tanakh. contains only eight chapters. The Song of Solomon is also called in the Vulgate the Cant Canticles. It is called the Song of Solomon's which we find in 1 verse 1, and, re and regarded as being the finest of its kind. The Song of Songs was written in circa 9, 900 B.C. The Song of Solomon is in a, a poem detailing the mutual love of Messiah and the Chosen under the emblem of the bridegroom and the bride. The content summary of the Song of Solomon is as follows. The book is called The Canticle of Canticles. That is to say, the most excellent of all canticles, because it is full of high mysteries relating to the union of Messiah and his spouse, or the bride, which is here begun by love and is to be eternal in heaven. The spouse of the Messiah is the chosen, more especially as to the happiest part of it, that is, the perfect souls, every one of us which is his beloved, his chosen. Song 1, the love and becoming humility of the bride. Song 2, love's communion and self-sacrificing devotion. Song 3, the signs of the bridegroom coming. Song four, the appearance of the bridegroom. Song five, the splendor of marriage. Song six, entering the inheritance. Song seven, the bride. <coughs> <coughs> Psalm 
Song eight, anticipating his coming. Song nine, the beauty of the bride. Song ten, the bride's longing and desire for the groom's return. Song eleven, the joy of the true marriage. Song twelve, love's labor in the future. Desire wisdom, desire your husband or wife, and above all, desire Yahuwah. The next book we find is Isaiah, 23rd book of the Tanakh, and it contains 66 chapters. Who was Isaiah? Isaiah prophesied in the reign of Uzziah, Jonathan, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. He is called the evangel evangelistical prophet due to his numerous prophecies concerning the coming and the character, the ministry, and the preaching of the suffering and the death of the Messiah. Isaiah is called the great prophet by the Ruach HaKodesh, which we find in Ecclesiastes 48.25. The foretelling of the coming of the Messiah Yahusha the mysteries of our redemption, the calling of the Gentiles, and the glorious establishment, perpetual flourishing of the believers. He may seem to have been rather an evangelistical, or an evangelist rather than a prophet. His very name is not without mystery, for Isaiah in Hebrew signifies the salvation of Yahuwah which is, of course, Yahusha, which means Yahuwah saves. He was, according to the tradition of the Hebrews, of the blood royal of the kings of Yehuda. It is not known for certain when or how Isaiah died, but in a word, uh, in a word called the ascension of Isaiah, it states that he was sawn in two <coughs> with a wooden saw, during the reign of Manasseh. Prophecy, he predicted that Babylon's kingdom would be permanently overthrown, which we find in Isaiah 13 and 19. He predicted that the Messiah would perform miracles and save mankind, Isaiah 35, 40, uh, 4 through 6. He predicted that the Messiah would be preceded by a messenger, which we find in Isaiah 40, 1, 5, and 9. He predicted the Babylon, that Babylon's gates would open for Cyrus, Isaiah 45, 1. He predicted that Yahuwah's salvation would reach the ends of the earth, Isaiah 49 and 6. He predicted that Yahuwah will never forget the children of Israel, Isaiah 49, 13 through 17. He predicted that the Messiah would be rejected, Isaiah 53, 1 through 3. He predicted that Yahuwah's servant would die for our sins, Isaiah 53, 4 through 6. He predicted that the true Messiah would be silent before his accusers, Isaiah 53 and 7. Isaiah ministered during the rule of Uzziah, Jonathan, Azaz Hezekiah about the coming judgment on the southern kingdom of, Ju uh, of Yehuda or Judah due to his great sinfulness and idolatry. He prophesied the Baraka Israel will enjoy if they repent. He also prophesied the suffering they will endure if they do not. He prophesied the downfall of Babylon. Philistia, Moab, Damascus, Egypt, and Samaria. Yahuwah will rescue and renew a faithful, obedient people for himself. Out of the ashes of Israel's failure and exile, through the coming of his, his servant king, the Messiah, Yahusha HaMashiach. Hallelujah. <clears throat> the next book is Jeremiah the 24th book of the Tanakh, and it contains 52 chapters. Jeremiah was a, pro, a, a priest, a native, an Anatha from the tribe of Benjamin. He was called to the prophetic office when he was very young. This was about 
70 years after the death of Isaiah. He exercised it about 40 years with a great faithfulness until the sins of the Hebrew nation came to their full measure and, the, and destruction soon followed. The prophecies of Jeremiah are that the Messiah would be a descendant of King David, Jeremiah 23, 5. Babylon would rule Yehuda or Judah for 70 years, Jeremiah 25, 11 through 12. The Hebrews would survive the rule of Babylonian rule and return home, Jeremiah 32, 36 and 37. Edom would be overthrown and humbled, Jeremiah 49 and 16. To summarize the book of Jeremiah, he reproofs the sin of the Hebrews. Jeremiah warns that Babylon would, be, would destroy Jerusalem. He urges uh, Jerusalem to turn from its sinful ways and the words of false prophets. The Israelites are carried away to Babylon. And he also predicts that the captive will return after 70 years to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple, which of course happened. Lamentations. It's the 25th book of the Old Testament or the Tanakh. And it only contains five chapters. The definition of lamentations is a laminate meaning a, a cry of sorrow and grief. Lamentations or laments the des desolation of Yehuda or Judah after the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC. Lamentation is traditionally attributed to the prophet Jeremiah. Lamentations consist of five separate poems. In Lamentation 1, the prophet dwells on the man manifold mis uh, miseries oppressed by which the city sits on a solitary uh, widow weeping sorely. In Lamentations 2, the miseries are described in connection with the uh, nation's sins that had caused them. Lamentations 3 speaks of hope for the people of Yahuwah. The chastisement would only be for their good. A better day would dawn for them. Lamentations 4. Laminates the ruins and desolation that had come upon the city and temple, but traces it only to the people's sins. Lamentation 5 is a prayer that Zion's reproach may be taken away in the repentance and recovery of the people. The, the utterance of Jeremiah's sorrow upon the capture of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. It basically is telling us that there is hope in the midst of punishment, which is rooted in Yahuwah's goodness. Ezekiel, it's the 26th book of the Tanakh or the Old Testament, and it contains 48 chapters. Ezekiel, whose name signifies the strength of Yahuwah, was of the priestly race, and of the number of captivities, and of the number of captives that were carried away to, to Babylon with the king Josian. He was contemporary with Jeremiah and prophesied to the same effect in Babylon as Jeremiah did in Jerusalem and is said to have ended his days in like manner by martyrdom. Kind of a short overview or a brief summary of the book of Ezekiel. 
He prophesies against various surrounding nations, against the Amorites, the Moabites, the Edomites, and the Philistines, Tyre and Sidon, and against Egypt. Prophecies delivered after the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, the triumphs of Israel, and of the kingdom of Yahuwah on earth, the messianic times, and the establishment and prosperity of the kingdom of Yahuwah, gives messages of warning and comfort to the Hebrews in their captivities. Daniel is the next book, which is the 27th book of the Tanakh, contains 12 chapters. Daniel was one of the four great prophets of Scripture. But unlike the other prophets, it is not said that Yahuwah spoke directly to Daniel. Instead, Daniel experienced dreams and visions. Daniel consists of two distinct parts. The first part consisting of the first six chapters is chiefly historical. The second part of the book of Daniel consists of the remaining six chapters and is chiefly prophetical. Daniel was among the Hebrews who were taken captive into Babylon, who rose to high position in government. The first detail of the period of captivity in Babylon is, is captured here. The prophetical part consists of three visions and one lengthened prophetical communication. The scriptural stories uh, that we find here in this book of Daniel, basically it starts with uh, Daniel and the three other uh, young Israelite men named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are held as prisoners in Babylon. They impress the king Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon with their wisdom, and he gives Daniel a role as a high-ranking official. Daniel impresses King Nebuchadnezzar again by interpreting his dreams. King Nebuchadnezzar then orders his empire to worship a huge golden image. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse and are thrown into a furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego rescued from the furnace by Yahuwah. Other officials are jealous of Daniel and plot to have him removed. They persuade the king to decree that everyone must pray only to him. Daniel continues to pray to Yahuwah and is thrown into the lion's den. Daniel is rescued from the lion's den by Yahuwah. Yahuwah gives Daniel visions of the future. The next book is Hosea. The 28th book of the Tanakh contains 14 chapters. Hosea was the son of Biri, of the kingdom of Israel, a prophet in the land of Israel, often referred to as the prophet of doom. Hosea's prophecies was that the house of Israel would be scattered. He was author of the book of prophecies bearing his name. It is believed that the book of Hosea was written between 755 and 725 B.C. It is the personal account of his prophetic message to the children of Israel and to the world. He is the only prophet of Israel who has left any written prophecy. We see... This, the verses from Hosea can be divided into two parts. The content summary of the book of Hosea are as follows. Chapter 1 through three, through 3 contain a description of an adulterous wife and a faithful husband, symbolic of the unfaithfulness of Israel to Yahuwah through idolatry. Chapter 3 through 14 contain the condemnation of Israel, especially Samaria, for the worship of idols and her eventual restoration. The key theme is the marriage between Hosea 
to the unfaithful Gomer, which is symbolic of the relationship between Yahuwah and Israel. The next book we come across is Joel, which is the 29th book in Scripture. Contains only three chapters. Joel is one of the groups of 12 prophetic books known as the Minor Prophets or as the Twelve. The book contains a prophecy of a great catastrophe consisting of a terrible drought and a plague of locusts. Prophet Joel then calls for people to repent and turn to the forgiveness of Yahuwah. He foretells the restoration of the land. Future prophecies telling of gifts to all of Yahuwah's people and their safety in the face of cosmic catastrophism. The prophetic foretells of judgments destined to fall on the enemies of Yahuwah. The next book we come across is the 30th book, which is Amos. It contains nine chapters. Amos was a Hebrew shepherd and a minor prophet. Amos was a shepherd, and Yahuwah influenced Amos in the sheepfolds, giving him the powers and the eloquence needed for them. Amos assures the 12 tribes of the destruction of the neighboring nations, and as they at the time gave themselves up to wickedness and idolatry. Amos reproves the, the Hebrew nation with sovereign the severity, but describes the restoration of the body by the Messiah. Next book is Obadiah, which is the 31st book. Only has one chapter. It's the shortest book of Scripture. They believe that Obadiah was written between 848 and 840 B.C. And Obadiah was a prophet, the fourth of the minor prophets. He was an Israelite who was chief in the household of King of Ahab, King of Israel. Edom was situated on the southern Dead Sea and adjacent to Jordan or Yarden. Obadiah is a prophet of Yahuwah who condemns Eden for sins against both Yahuwah and Israel. The Edomites were descendants of Esau, whereas the Israelites are descendant of his twin brothers Jacob. A quarrel between the brothers affected their descendants for over a thousand years. The Edomites forbade Israel to cross their land during the exodus from Egypt. Obadiah's prophecies is that the kingdom of Edom will be destroyed completely and the destruction of Israel because of their unfaithfulness. The next book is Jonah. 30, uh, the 32nd book of the Tanakh that has four chapters. Jonah is sent to preach to Nineveh. The name Nineveh has the meaning habitant, habitation of uh, Ninus. So Nineveh was an ex exceedingly great city, which was located on the eastern banks of the Tigris and the ancient Assyria. Jonah did not wish to become a prophet, uh, so Yahuwah caused a great storm to throw him overboard from a ship. Jonah was saved by being swallowed by a whale that vomited him out onto dry land. The 
See, Yahuwah sends Jonah to preach to the wicked city called Nineveh. But Jonah refuses to go to Nineveh and boards a ship going to another destination instead. But Yahuwah sends a great storm which threatens the ship. Jonah realizes that the storm is a punishment from Yahuwah because of his disobedience. Jonah asks to be thrown overboard after which the storm subsides. Then we find that Jonah is swallowed alive by a great whale. While Jonah is inside the belly of the whale, he prays to Yahuwah. The whale spits him out on the dry land. Jonah goes to Nineveh and preaches to its people. Nineveh repents and is saved. As we can see here, the story that we need to make sure that we do not disregard what we're being told to do. You might be you might be thrown overboard and you might be swallowed by some great fish or something. But the end story here is that he went, he preaches to the people, and the people repent and are saved. That's what obedience will do for us. Micah is the next book, the 33rd book of the Tanakh, contains seven chapters. Micah was a man of Mount Ephraim, whose history is introduced in Judges 17. Micah leads to an account of the settlement of the tribe of Dan in northern Palestine, and for the purpose also of illustrating the lawlessness of the times in which he lived. Micah tells of his prophecies foretelling the destruction of Jerusalem. The idolatry of Samaria and Jerusalem are denounced by the prophet Micah. Micah predicts the punishment of the people and the destruction of Israel. The prophet reproves the, uh, the princes for their cruelty and oppression of the false prophets. Micah predicts the victory of Israel over other nations. Israel is reproved from its sins and the corruption of Israel. The punishment of Israel is prophesied. Micah, the prophet, comforts Israel, promising that it will be restored to its land and will triumph over its enemies. Nahum is the 34th book contains only three chapters. It's believed to be written between 663 and 612 BC. Nahum was the seventh of the so-called minor prophets and believed by some to be from Elkosh, which is believed to be situated on the east bank of the Tigris. At this time, Nineveh had conquered the kingdom of Israel. Nineveh was the ancient Assyrian capital city situated on the Tigris across from the modern city of Mosul in the northern part of which now is called Iraq. The evil Nineveh had once responded to the preaching of Jonah to serve the to, to, to serve Yahuwah. After 150 years, Nineveh returned to idolatry, violence, and arrogance. Yahuwah sends another of his prophets, Nahum, to Nineveh, preaching judgment in the destruction of the city and exhorting them to repent. The Ninevites do not heed the warning of Nahum, and the city was brought under the dominion of Babylon. The next book... Habakkuk, which is the 35th book of the Tanakh, and it contains three chapters. Habakkuk was a Hebrew prophet and the author of the book that bears his name. See, the Chaldeans were the inhabitants of ancient Chaldea. Chaldea was part of Babylonia, an ancient kingdom 
in in the southern Mesopotamia. Babylonia conquered Israel in the 6th century BC and the exile of the Hebrews to Babylon. Habakkuk consists of three chapters, the contents of which are described when the prophet is is in the in the Ruach and saw the formidable power of the Chaldeans approaching and menacing his land and saw the great evils they would cause in Judea. He bore his com complaints and doubts before Yahuwah, the just and the pure. On this occasion, the future punishment of the Chaldeans was revealed to him, which we find in chapter 2. In the third, a uh, presentiment of the destruction of his country and the inspired heart of the prophet contends with his hope that the enemy would be chastised. The third is a sublime song dedicated to the chief musician and therefore intended apparently to be used in the worship of Yahuwah. It is unequaled in majesty and splendor of language and imagery. Zephaniah is the 36th book. It contains only three chapters. Zephaniah was one of the minor prophets and the great-grandson of Hezekiah, the king of Judah. He made his prophecies in the days of Hosea, the king of Judah, which we find as uh, 641 to 610 B.C., and was contemporary with Jeremiah. See, this book is announcing the judgment of the world and the judgment upon Israel because of their transgressions. It also speaks of the description of the judgment, which you find in Zephaniah 1, 7, and 18. An exhortation to seek Yahuwah while there is still time, Zephaniah 2, 1, and 3. The announcement of judgment on the heathen, Zephaniah 2, 4, and 15. The hopeless misery of Jerusalem, which you find in Zephaniah 3, 1 through 7. The promise of salvation, Zephaniah 3, 8 through 20. The next is Haggai, 37th book, which contains two chapters. Haggai was one of the minor prophets and may have been one of the, kept, uh, of the captives taken to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. He returned from Babylon in the first year of the reign of King of Cyrus. The prophecies of Haggai are regarding the rebuilding of the temple of Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity. He began his ministry about 16 years after return from Babylon, and work on the temple was resumed after 15 years of neglect because of the opposition of the Sumerians, the Samaritans through the efforts of Haggai and Zeph uh, Zechariah. He was the first of the three prophets. Zechariah, his contemporary, Malachi, who was about 100 years later. Haggai was commissioned by Yahuwah to assure the people that the second temple should be more glorious than the former, because the Messiah should honor it with his presence. Just a basic overview of Haggai. We find the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem had not begun. In the second year of Darius Hephaestus, 520 B.C., speaks against Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel and the governor of, uh, and Joshua, the high priest. Haggai then speaks to the people about their indifference to the rebuilding of the temple, which is in the complete contrast to the care taken to ensure that their homes are comfortable. Haggai warns them that drought and hard times will be the penalty for failing to rebuild the temple. The words of Haggai have the desired effect. 
Haggai announces that Yahuwah is with them and work on the temple begins. <clears throat> the 38th book of scripture is Zechariah. Contains 14 chapters. Zechariah was a prophet of Judah. Zechariah was a Hebrew priest and a Pharisee. Zechariah, or Zechariah, was the father of John the Baptist and a, rel and a relative by marriage to Yahusha. Zechariah was the husband of Elizabeth. Both were advancing years, and Elizabeth was barren. According to the Gospel of Luke, while Zechariah ministered at the golden altar of incense, an angel of Yahuwah announced to him that his wife would give birth to a son. He was told he was to name his son John, and that this son would be the forerunner of the Messiah. Luke 1, 12-17 Elizabeth duly conceived. At this time, her cousin Mary was visited by the angel Gabriel and became pregnant with Yahusha. Miriam visited her cousin Elizabeth to share the good news of Miriam's expected child and discovered that her much older cousin was also expected, expecting the birth of a son, John. The book of Zechariah recalls the nation's past history for the purpose of presenting a solemn warning to the present generation. It details eight visions, one, seven through six, uh, one, seven and six through eight, succeeding one another in one night involving the, the crowning of Joshua, which we find in six, nine through 15. It then describes how the kingdom of the world became the kingdom of Yahuwah's Messiah. Chapter 7 and chapter 8 consist of an address to the people answering whether the days of mourning for the destruction of the city should be kept any longer, and the words of encouragement assuring them that Yahuwah's presence and Baraka are present. Chapter 9 through 14 consists of two burdens outlining the course of Yahuwah's provincial dealings with his people down to the time of the advent. The 39th book is Malachi. It contains four chapters and is the last book of the Tanakh or the Old Testament. Malachi, whose name signifies the angel of Yahuwah, was contemporary with Nehemiah. He was the last of the prophets in the order of time and lived about 400 years before Yahusha. His prophecies foretold of the coming of Yahusha, the Messiah, the reprobation of the Hebrews and their sacrifices, and the calling of the Gentiles who should offer up to Yahuwah in every place an acceptable sacrifice. The prophecies of Malachi are regarding the rebuilding of the temple after the Babylonian captivity. In chapter 1, Yahuwah reproaches the Hebrews with their ingratitude and the priests for not offering pure sacrifices. He will accept of the sacrifices that shall be offered in every place amongst the Gentiles. Chapter 2, the priests are sharply reproved for neglecting their covenant the evil of marrying with idolaters, and too easily putting away their wives. Chapter 3, Messiah shall come to his temple and purify the priesthood. They that continue in their evil ways should be punished, but true penitents shall receive a, a baraka. Chapter 4, the judgment of the wicked, the reward of the just, an exhortation to observe the Torah, the commandments. Elias shall come for the conversation, uh, conversion of the Hebrews. So these prophecies relating to the calling of the Gentiles and the coming Messiah. 
I have loved you, says Yahuwah. Yahuwah wants our best. But it also, we find the judgment is coming, which is outlined in chapter 4. And that concludes our overview of the Tanakh, the Old Testament. We'll, we'll go ahead and con, uh, continue this next week with uh, the end of the of the study with uh, the New Covenant or the New Testament. Brit Hadashah. I pray that this message has spoke some type of wisdom to you, a better understanding, maybe refresh some things that you had not remembered, and that this will bring everything into light for us as we continue on in our journey for wisdom and understanding of the ways of Yahuwah. Until next week, may Yahuwah be with you. May he barak you. May his face shine upon you. And may he give you his shalom. May Yahuwah barak you in all your ways. Shalom.